Hallelujah. 
prolific gospel singers that the world has ever known uh, is one that I refer to as Sir Edwin Hawkins. Uh, we would commonly call him Edwin Hawkins, but whenever I respect someone that much, I call them Sir Edwin Hawkins. He was born in 1943. He died in 2018. But somewhere between 1967 and 1968, uh, he wrote a song and performed it with the Edwin Hawkins Singers, and that song was entitled, Oh Happy Day. Uh, in Germany, it immediately went to the number one spot on the Billboard charts. Shortly thereafter, when the song was released in the United States, it immediately went to the top five. He sang about an old happy day. Well, in Acts chapter 2 and verse 1, and then down in verse 41, you read about another old happy day. In Acts 2, and I'm reading from the Message Bible, Acts 2 uh, and verse 1, the Bible says, when the day or the feast of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Then you drop down to verse 41 of Acts chapter 2. The Bible says that day about 3,000 took him at his word. They were baptized and were signed up. If Edwin Hawkins had an old happy day to talk about, there is certainly an old happy day in Acts chapter 2 verse 1 and in Acts chapter 2 verse 41. That's the, su the subject I want to speak from this morning, oh happy day. For every life that was changed in Acts chapter 2, it was a happy day. Day. And I want to walk through that day this morning. I want to take this and try to break it into some pieces that you can take with you on your way home. Uh, the first piece is this. That day, God used some flawed vessels. That day, God used some flawed vessels. If you were ever able to visit the first century and go down to what would be considered a potter's house, you would discover that in the potter's house is where the potter worked on a manual wheel that was controlled by the potter's foot. The potter would kick the wheel to cause the wheel to turn. The moist, wet, clay would be spinning on top of the potter's wheel. The potter would then take his fingers and based on where he positioned his fingers and the amount of pressure he applied with his fingers, it would control the piece of pottery shaping on the wheel. Much to people's surprise, Pottery that was fixed on the wheel had to be finished in the fire. That is, it didn't matter how pretty it looked when the potter got done with it on the wheel. In order for it to be a vessel that could provide long-term use, it had to be taken from the wheel and placed in the fire. Well, there were some days and some occasions when as the potter worked on the moist clay, what looked good on the wheel did not look good when it came out of the fire. The potter would then take that finished piece of clay, walk out into the yard behind his house, and dash that piece of pottery on a pile of broken clay pieces. Yet on the inside of the potter's house, on every shelf that he could locate on his wall, was a piece of pottery that was pleasant to the potter. 
That is, the pieces that looked good made it on the wall. The pieces that didn't look so good ended up in the backyard on a broken pile of pottery. Aren't you glad that even though many of us may not have made it from the potter's wheel to the shelf on the inside of the house, God went to the backyard and found us. Oh, okay, all right, maybe I'm the only one. Uh, I, I didn't end up on the shelf in the potter's house. I ended up in the backyard of the potter's house where all of the broken pieces of pottery were. But the supreme potter walked through the potter's house, walked past the pieces on the shelf, walked past the potter working on pieces on the wheel, went all the way in the backyard and found little old me. He found a flawed and broken vessel, a vessel that was not perfect. And God said even a broke crayon can still make some pretty colors. God uses broken, flawed vessels. The Bible records in Acts chapter 2 and verse 1, the Bible says, when the feast of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. And the question I had when I read Acts chapter 2 and verse 1 was, who are the they that they were speaking of? To learn the answer to that question, you do not find it in chapter 2. You find the answer, Brother Greg, in chapter 1. There you discover that the disciples of Jesus are the they who are referred to in chapter 2. And what I want to say to you about these men that the Lord used is that they were plain, old, ordinary people. Uh, they had common jobs in their day like fishermen. At least one of them was a tax collector. That was a hated job in their day and is not looked upon too kindly in our day. <laughs> one of the worst kind of letters you can get is a letter from the IRS. Uh, so Tamara, I received a letter from the IRS several years ago uh, that said that I owed them several thousand dollars from a tax return that had been filed all the way back in 2002. They said I owed them several thousand dollars. I called my tax preparer. He contacted them, filled out some paperwork. They wrote me back and said, Mr. Thorpe, but you don't owe us several thousand dollars. We owe you a couple of thousand dollars. Then Sister Michelle, they sent me another letter a week later and said that the statute of limitations had run out on the money that they owed me. One of the worst things you want to get is a letter from the IRS. And one of Jesus' disciples was a chief tax collector. What am I getting at? These were plain old ordinary men. They dealt with fear. They dealt with doubt. They dealt with uh, pride. They dealt with jealousy. They were plain old ordinary human beings. But if God used them, God can use you. And the question that I want to ask you this morning, wherever you may be, is have you written yourself off? Did you make a mistake and you have been so beaten and burdened down by that mistake until you no longer feel that you can be used by God? God sent me by here to tell you that the Lord can do some extraordinary things with plain old ordinary people. And if you wrote you off, let God write you back on. If you wrote you out, let God write you back in. 
You may have fallen, but that doesn't mean you're finished. I wish I had somebody who knew what I was talking about. You may not have been successful the first time, but that doesn't mean you won't be successful the next time. God used that day some flawed vessels. That day, God used flawed vessels. That's not all. The text teaches us further that that day, God used some faithful vessels. These men who followed Christ were indeed flawed, but they were also very faithful. Uh, in Acts chapter 1, verse 12, down through verse 14, we are told about the faithfulness of these men. In verse 12 through verse 14 of Acts 1, you find these words. So they left the mountain called Olives and returned to Jerusalem. It was a little over half a mile. Watch this. They went to the upper room they had been using as a meeting place. There was Peter, John, James, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, Simon the Zealot, Judas, son of James. Here's where I've been trying to get. Verse 14. They were they agreed they were in this for good, completely together in prayer, the women included, also Jesus' mother Mary and his brothers. What did they agree to? They agreed that we are in this for good. We are completely together in prayer. They were flawed, but they were faithful. And you don't have to be perfect, but you can be faithful. You don't have to be sinless, but you can be faithful. If I had somebody who was working for me and they were running into problems that made it a little difficult for them to make it on time, please do your job well when you do show up. Which means all of us can make a mistake, but when you bounce back from the mistake that you made, at least be faithful in what God has called you to do. May I ask you a rather probing question? I asked you one earlier. I asked you, had you given up on yourself? Had you written yourself off? I'm going to ask you a second question. You ready for it? How much of you does God really have? How many rooms in your spiritual house is the Lord really welcome in? <laughs> it, it, it's funny thing about new stuff. Okay, let me, let me get deep. 99.9 .9 of us in here who are either homeowners or you, even, even if you just live in a house, regardless of whether you're the adult or the child, 99.9 .9 of us in here have at least a drawer. We don't want nobody to go in. All the stuff we don't really have a place for ends up in that drawer. Button you found, you don't remember what shirt is supposed to go on, ends up in the drawer. You got about 12 pins in there, don't write no more. They all end up in, in the drawer. Bottle openers, bottle caps, stuff you don't know what you're going to do, anything with, ends up in the drawer. Hey, let me warn young people. That if you keep a drawer like that too long when you're living in somebody else's house, when you get grown, it will become a whole room. Because this is grown folks in here. You got a whole room. Now, if you were just moving in and you were giving somebody a tour, they get to see earth. Be there six months. Then all of a sudden, you got a room 
You don't want nobody to go in. Because there's some stuff in there you don't even know what it is. And if you were giving Jesus a tour of your house, you would say, and Lord, here's this room. And Lord, here's that room. Then you skip over the door that's closed with a key lock, pad lock, armed security guard. And you say, Lord, you have access to every room in this house, but please don't go into this one. How much of you does God really have? These disciples said to him in Acts chapter 1, we are in this for good. We are in this for the long haul. And Lord, however you decide to use us, you have our permission. Why? Because that day God used flawed vessels but that day, God used faithful vessels. How much of you does God really have? A little girl years ago uh, was given money by her mother on a Sunday morning. A little girl was on her way to Sunday school, and when Sunday school was over, she had been given permission to stop by the corner store and get an ice cream cone. A mother had given her two silver coins, two nickels. One nickel was to put in church. The other nickel was to purchase the ice cream cone when church was over. On her way to church, the little girl was skipping, holding on to both nickels in one hand. As she went across a rickety wooden bridge, she tripped on the bridge, almost fell, lost a portion of her grip, one of those nickels jumped out, rolled along the bridge, hit a crack in the bridge, plummeted down into the waters beneath. The little girl walked all the way up to the crack, looked down through the crack just in time to see the nickel plummeting into the water and said, God, there goes your nickel. This other nickel is going to be going with me to the store to get me some ice cream. How much of you does the Lord really have? Are you giving God the leftovers? Or are you giving him your very best? That day, God used faithful vessels. There's a third element contained in the text, and it is this. Not only is it true that that day God used flawed vessels, and that day God used faithful vessels, the third element in the text is this. That day God changed religious people. The book of Acts, the second chapter, records what we refer to as the day of Pentecost. Uh, that was an annual feast day that occurred some 50 days after the Jewish celebration of Passover. This particular day of Pentecost also occurred 40 days after Jesus' resurrection. People were drawn together from the entire known world. They came to participate in an annual religious feast because they were religious people. That day, something different happened. The religion that they had learned about from their childhood was manifested right in front of them. And many of them who showed up that day as religious people became born again people. Which means God used some flawed men who were willing to be faithful to transform some people who for most of their lives had only been religious. And here's my question to you. Is your religion good enough? Has it changed you? 
Do you come to church simply because church is the thing you do? Or has something happened on the inside of you so that being around God's people is no longer optional for you? You just can't help yourself. Has God moved you from the place of only being religious and brought you to a place of completely being transformed? In verse 1 through verse 11 of chapter 2, uh, Luke, who is the author of this passage, records this uh, beginning of this religious transformation. The Bible says in verse 1, when the Feast of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Without warning, there was a sound like a strong wind, gale force. No one could tell where it came from. It filled the whole building. Then, like a wildfire, the Holy Spirit thread, spread through their ranks. And they started speaking in a number of different languages as the Spirit prompted them. There were many Jews staying in Jerusalem just then. Devout pilgrims from all of, over the world. When they heard the sound, they came on the run. Then when they heard one after another, their own mother tongues being spoken, they were thunderstruck. They couldn't, for the life of them, figure out what was going on and kept saying, aren't these all Galileans? How come we are hearing them talk in our various mother tongues? Then the Bible names all the different nationalities that they were from. One after another, they witnessed something that they had never seen before. They witnessed people who only knew one language be able to communicate in multiple languages. And not only did they hear them speak, they understood what they said, and what they said was glorifying God. And they were so impacted through this experience until they concluded that religion was no longer enough for them. They needed to have a relationship. And what God wants to do for you wherever you are in life is move you to the place of having religion all the way to the place of having a relationship. See, if you're in a relationship only because you get flowers on Valentine's Day, what happens when they lose their job? Can't buy no flowers. Can't even afford to put fertilizer down so wildflowers won't even grow in the backyard. <laughs> what do you do when all you have left is the best they can do? When that which was not starts going south. What do you do when life changes? What do you do when they go through periods of depression? What do you do when they go through periods of sickness? Because if all you have is a religious connection, and not a true foundational relationship. You have nothing left when the thrill is gone. Y'all didn't know B.B. King uh, was gonna show up today. Don't, don't make me say that. <laughs> B.B. say the thrill is gone. Don't, 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 don't make me, don't, don't make me sing it in church. Don't, don't make me sing it uh, in church. That day, God changed some religious people. Well, that day God used some flawed vessels. That day God used some faithful people. That day God changed some religious people. I want to show you finally. That day God saved all who would come.
thief died on the cross hanging next to Jesus, turned to Jesus and said to him, when you come into your kingdom, remember me. I thought that was interesting because of all the people who were hanging on the cross that day, we know there were at least three crosses present, a cross on the left, cross on the right. Jesus was right where he was supposed to be in the middle. The two men who were hanging on either side of Jesus were condemned, convicted criminals. And one of them who started off complaining about Jesus made a request of Jesus. He said to him, when you come into your kingdom, remember me. Uh, I was shaken by the words of that thief, so I called him. And I said, uh, sir, I don't mean you any harm. He said, go ahead on thought, I know you. <laughs> I said, sir, I would like to ask you uh, to confirm the charges that were leveled against you. He says, yes, there were a whole list of charges. He said, there could have been more charges if they had done their investigation better. That means I was guilty of the crimes I was being condemned for, but I was also guilty of some other crimes they just didn't investigate. I said, well, sir, given your criminal history and the fact that you are hanging on this cross, what gave you the right to ask Jesus to remember you? The thief said, Mr. Thorpe, I want to thank you for your question. You asked such wonderful questions. He said, well, if my memory serves me correctly, I didn't ask you to remember me. <laughs> I asked Jesus to remember me. And if you want to know where I get the right from, the Bible says that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord, they shall be. Which means my name does not have to be in everyone's address book. Jesus loves me. I may not be everybody's cup of tea, but Jesus loves me. And he loved me enough to die for me and to send his spirit to live on the inside of me. In Acts chapter 2 verse 12 through verse 36, uh, that's where you find the sermon that was delivered on that day as Peter stood up and preached to them about Jesus Christ. But in verse 37 down through verse 47, you find how the people responded to Peter's preaching. Watch verse 37. The Bible says, cut to the quick. That means they were cut down to their core. Those who were there listening asked Peter and the other apostles, brothers, brothers, so now what do we do? That's how you know when you've had good church. You know you've had good church when you leave asking yourself, what am I going to do for the rest of today to make up for the mess I made yesterday? What do we do? Here's Peter's response. Change your life. Turn to God and be baptized, each of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, so your sins are forgiven. Receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is targeted to you and your children, but also to all who are far away, whomever, in fact, our Master God invites. He went on in this vein or in this speaking tradition for a long time, urging them over and over, get out while you can. Get out of this sick and stupid culture. That day, about 3,000 took him at his word, were baptized and were signed up. They committed themselves to the teaching of the apostles, the life together, the common meal, and the prayers. Everyone around was in awe. 
All those wonders and signs were done through the apostles and all the believers lived in a wonderful harmony, holding everything in common. They sold whatever they owned and pooled their resources so that each person's need was met. They followed a daily discipline of worship in the temple, followed by meals at home, every meal a celebration, exuberant and joyful as they praised God. People in general liked what they saw. Every day their number grew as God added to those who were saved. After he transformed those who had been religious, he started transforming everybody. What am I getting at? There's room at the cross for you. One of the greatest preachers that the universe has ever known preached in England for decades. His name was Charles Haddon Spurgeon. Uh, in my office, I have thousands uh, of his writings on my uh, shelves, my bookshelves. Uh, Charles Haddon Spurgeon spoke in a day where the auditoriums that he spoke in seated thousands of people, but they did not have PA or public address systems. That is, without a microphone, he spoke to thousands of people at one time. In order to do that, the buildings had to be specifically designed so that acoustics was their number one priority. And whenever he would go to speak at a church that he was not familiar with, he would always walk out onto the platform and say something and see what response he heard from the room itself. He was checking the acoustics in the room. And one day, while preparing to preach at a church, he went out into the auditorium earlier during the day and he quoted John chapter 1 and verse 29. And he said, while standing in the pulpit, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world and walked off the platform. What he did not find out until sometime later is that way out in the sanctuary was a carpenter down on his hands and knees repairing the floor. He didn't see Dr. Spurgeon. Dr. Spurgeon didn't see him. But he heard the words, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And what that carpenter concluded is that if the Lord is looking for sinners, I'm one. And right there on the floor, he stayed where he was, prayed, gave his heart and life to Jesus Christ. And he's in heaven today. May I ask you something? Have you told him yes? Have you told the Lord, if you're looking for a sinner, I know where you can find one. It's not my mother. It's not my father. It's not my sister. It's not my brother. But it's me, oh Lord. Standing in the need of prayer. Just like Jesus saved 3,000 on the day of God. Just like he saved a dying thief while hanging on the cross. Just like he saved the carpenter down on his hands and knees. He can save you today if you will simply come to him. 